right, hello everybody. Welcome to uh, lecture five. Today we're going to talk about um, primary fermentation, also known as alcoholic fermentation. Um, they're used synonymously, so there's typically um, two fermentations that happen in a red wine, sometimes in white wines too. Today we're just going to talk about the first fermentation, which is the conversion of sugar to um, carbon dioxide and alcohol. So um, yeah, this is where all of the really interesting stuff starts to really take off for winemaking. Um, so I'm really excited to dive into this uh, second section for us. So um, yeah, so yeah, I guess let's just get started. Um, so what is yeast and why is it so important? And we're also, so that's a big question we're going to answer today. And then also we're going to talk about um, the microbiology and kinetics of winemaking. So that's um, a lot more intimidating. Um, it sounds more intimidating than it is. So um, don't worry about that. It's going to be good. Okay, cool. So as we talked about, um, in our previous lecture, the main yeast used for winemaking is Saccharomyces species. Um, that's this massive word right here. Well, the cool thing about this species is that it's used in other food and beverages like all over the world. It's one of the most diverse species that we use um, for consumption, which is pretty amazing. So um, this chart here, if you can see this left side, these are all the different species that are used just in wine just in wine. So when you think about, first of all, how many different varieties of wine there is out there, in addition to that, how many freaking millions of possibilities you have of different yeast to use. And this is just Saccharomyces. You could use something else completely if you wanted to, but this is a, typically the most used for its performance. Um, just think of all the possibilities of all the flavors and aromas that can um, result just from the yeast that you choose. So it's one of the most amazing things about winemaking is just how that one decision alone can give you so many outcomes. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. Also, we have rum here, if you're a big rum drinker. Uh, bread, we have floor. This is also related to winemaking. This is more of um, sherry wine. This is the yeast that develops on the surface of a wine layer when um, it's consuming oxygen and ethanol, and it kind of develops those sherry-like flavors, and, and we can talk about that later. Um, this is basically just a different type of yeast. We also have cheese, uh, laboratory yeast that might be to help um, synthesize um, certain medicines. I'll use yeast to transform things. Uh, we also have Asia distillery. Every type of distilled beverage that you drink was first fermented by some kind of yeast. So sake is another good um, example of that. We also have Oak Japan. Um, Palm, wine, Burkina Faso. Anyways, just in a huge amount of things that are related to yeast, um, and mostly most of them being the beverages that we drink. So keep that in mind as we um, talk about our lecture today. And, um, you know, you can find an application that's interesting to you. So yeast are a single cell. So unicellular, it's a fungus that reproduces by budding, also known as fission, and they're capable of converting sugar to alcohol and carbon dioxide. So they're commonly used in beer, wine, general baking, uh, medical science, etc. Just to give you a straightforward uh, definition on that. Fermentation is the process of converting sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide in the absence of oxygen. The more sugar there is, the more alcohol that's produced. Uh, the primary sugars that are being fermented here are glucose and fructose. And the alcohol we are produce, producing is ethanol. So that has um, two carbons and then a one hydrogen chain on the end. So it's eth. So there's two. Methanol would be just one carbon, uh, carbon chain here with the hydroxide at the end as well. So an example for the relationship between sugar to alcohol, if you have 24 bricks, you're going to get 14.4% alcohol. 28 bricks will give you a higher alcohol, 17.5. And as we hopefully already know from our first exam, to calculate potential alcohol, you would just take your initial bricks, multiply it by um, either 0 0.55 or 0 0.6, either way. And that'll give you the potential alcohol, the theorized alcohol at the end of your fermentation. So uh, why do we calculate this? Well, it's important to understand the percentage of alcohol you're going to end up with because um, you're, you would be able to determine the likeliness that your fermentation will go into completion. 
So typically for an extremely high alcohol, the, which we're going to find out here in a couple of slides, is that you're going to stress out your yeast and they can only operate within a certain percentage of alcohol. So if you are taking it up to 17 percent, it's most likely that your yeast will not be able to live in that solution because the alcohol creates them to um, literally break apart. The cells will start to die off. And we're going to talk about that in, in a couple of slides here. Um, also, you'd want to know potential alcohol personally um, just to see how it affects the organoleptic. So that, that's just a really fancy word for sensory properties of your wine. So if you want a high alcohol wine, you know, it might come off as hotter. Some people say that high alcohol wines have more body. So if that's what you're going for, then definitely choose a yeast that's going to perform well with high alcohol and then also make sure you have the proper sugar content to get there. Uh, same on the other side, the flip side of that coin with low alcohol wines, make sure you're starting with a low sugar um, harvest and going from there. So stylistic, um, you know, stylistic uh, decisions are made with that and then also just um, stability and safety of the wine for completeness of fermentation. Okay, so here is a sugar to potential alcohol chart. This is just to reinforce that, you know, the higher the, sh higher the sugar content, the higher the alcohol you're going to get. So at 14 bricks, uh, your potential alcohol is only 7.6%, which is fine if you want to make a hard cider. But as you go up the charts here, you know, here's 24 bricks, 14.4%, wonderful, 25, 15.1, and then finally 28, you get 17.5% alcohol. So just to reinforce that for you guys. Okay. So if you are getting a final alcohol that's that's different from what you had calculated for potential, that's okay. That happens a lot. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. So number one reason is that the yeast you are using is super efficient in converting uh, sugar to alcohol. So it's able to take those sugar molecules and um, able to produce more alcohol than a typical yeast would do. Um, another put another reason that it could be um, different than what your expected value was is because you had an inaccurate initial sugar reading. So, um, you know, if you had grapes that were dehydrated and were raisins in your must, they could be um, extracting a lot more sugar from those than you had first calculated in the beginning. Um, also, you could have a higher solid to skin to liquid ratio or solid skin to liquid ratio. So that could um, mess up your reading as well. Okay very exciting. So why do I care if my fermentation finishes? Um, well, what happens if your fermentation isn't finished is you are left with residual sugar, which is not bad if you're planning on making a port style wine or if you're planning on making a sweeter white wine or even a sweeter red, you know, and you had um, filtered it and then, you know, used SO2 to protect it. But if you are not planning on that and you're kind of just hanging around and waiting for that wine to go dry, meaning there's no residual sugar left virtually, um, then you have all of these nutrients out and your big hitters are off of, you know, aren't, in, aren't playing anymore. Your yeast aren't really active. Then, you know, that's when the spoilage organisms start to come in and to utilize what the food that you've left out for them, basically. So that's why I have in purple in the corner of the slide, remember, when there are nutrients available, something will utilize it. So definitely remember that when you're working with a fermentation that hasn't been completed. Um, it puts your wine at a very big risk. So unless you want to turn your wine into, um, sell it to a distillery or turn it into vinegar, highly suggest that you be careful of that for sure. Okay, so what causes a stuck fermentation? Typically, it's lack of nutrients. So uh, nitrogen, as we're going to learn in, in a lecture here pretty soon when we talk about fermentation nutrients, um, is extremely important. It has to deal with um, how, how well your yeast reproduce, so they produce a larger like, colony size, but also it's extremely important because it deals with the um, ability for the yeast to develop healthy cell walls. So um, the different ways we have nitrogen in a couple different ways here. We talk about yeast assimilable nitrogen. So this is something that can be measured in a lab. A lot of wineries will do this with incoming grapes just to see, you know, how the grapes are doing from the vineyard. Um, do they have enough nitrogen in the skins to feed my yeast or do I need to add more? 
and certain varieties will have a higher demand than others. It's also really important to look at the yeast that you choose because they might have a high nitrogen requirement and to make sure you measure that in your must to make sure that the numbers are matching, that it has enough nitrogen for your yeast to perform well. So um, you can almost think of it as putting oil in your car. If your car doesn't have any oil, it's not going to run well. Some vehicles, depending on whether you drive a sports car or something else, might have a, um, have a more intense requirement for the quality of oil and how much is used. So, and Forgive me if I completely butchered that. It seemed like a good comparison to me. And if it's if it's if you are a car person, you know better. Please uh, excuse me on that one. <laughs> so yes, there is yeast assimilable nitrogen, um, which is known as YAN. So this is a combination of um, you know basically just a lot of components that are within the grape. So a free amino nitrogen, ammonia, ammonium that can be added in the form of DAP. So this is something that you can add to the fermentation. It's diammonium phosphate. You want to be careful, so don't don't get too caught up in memorizing all of this stuff right here. I just want you to know, if you are into the chemistry, that that's there. All you need to know is that nitrogen, at this point, all you need to know is nitrogen is extremely important, and lack of it can cause a stuck fermentation. So write that down if, um, you, if you know you're going to overthink it. So too much yan, so too much of this nitrogen nutrients um, can be... Um, left over and be exciting for spoilage, yeast and bacteria after fermentation. So we don't want to add too much. We also don't want to add too little because then the yeast that you do want aren't getting the nutrients they need and they can um, shut down near the end of the fermentation. So we don't want that. Okay, secondly, um, causes of a stuck fermentation is the fermentation was overheated or I'd put a note here, um, also on the other side of that, the fermentation got too cold. So if you're trying to run a red wine fermentation and someone forgot to turn off the chiller on the tank, it's definitely going to slow it down and it could get to a point where it doesn't complete its fermentation. So we already know from the beginning of this lecture that sugar, that yeast converts sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide, right? Well, in addition to that, heat is also a byproduct. So during the fermentation, the you know, the yeast is, I guess you could say it's like partying, you know, it's, it's eating sugar, it's, it's farting out CO2 and ethanol, whatever. Um, but it's also producing heat in this process. It's getting really active. It's getting really excited. Um, it's going up. So at this point, it can overheat if you're not watching your temperature daily or if you, you know, for some reason it gets cold, it starts to slow down. You can actually heat up your tank to try to um, get it moving again. You could almost think of uh, bread rising. If you've ever made bread before, you want it to be in a, in a warmer environment so that yeast can start um, activating and consuming sugars from that as well. So um, yeah, definitely something to think about. That's the kinetics side of that. Um, just seeing what your yeast need and provide it to them. Kind of straightforward. So here's the big here's the big one right here. Okay, how will I know if my fermentation will go into completion? This slide has a big star on it. So you'd be expected to list these on an exam. Just just the four of these, just like this. But it's good for you to know. So that way, when you talk to someone after this class, they know that you learned something important from this class. And also, as a winemaker, if you're going into the industry, if you are having a hard time with your fermentation, it brings you back to the basics. So if your fermentation's having issues. Number one, does it have enough nutrients? So sufficient EN, yeast assimilable nitrogen. Does it have enough oxygen? We're going to talk about oxygen here in a second when you want it, when you don't. Typically, I know people, when they think about wine, they think, oh, oxygen is a bad thing. During fermentation, it's a really positive thing. So um, we're going to talk about that in a couple slides here. Three, temperature. Just like I said, if it gets too hot or if it gets too cold, it can um, inhibit your yeast. They'll get stressed out and they'll die or they'll um, get so cold they shut down. Then there's also alcohol inhibition. So we talked about this. Um, we talked about port style wines, about adding alcohol to um, kill off yeast. So it's actually kind of a relaxing lecture because you guys already know some of this, um, but this is just taking you into the next next step. There's lots of crossover in this class. So you'll learn more every day, of course. Okay, nutrients. Number one, sugar. Uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. We need sugar to make alcohol. If you don't have a fruit that contains sugar, the yeast aren't going to be happy because they can't eat anything. Uh, nitrogen, number two, like we were just talking about. 
Most wines are nitrogen deficient. Um, this allows your yeast to produce more rapidly, so it increases the population. Helps to fasten the fermentation, so it's a much more efficient fermentation. Takes you from point A to point B, uh, much less stress for you, and you know that it's taken care of. And it also helps to increase the yeast tolerance to alcohol, so it makes it more resilient. So that's what I was talking about earlier when we were saying how um, alcohol will start to make the yeast lice and, and fall apart and just kind of, you know, split apart. Well, the nitrogen will create a healthier cell wall. You know, the, the proteins that are within the cell wall are synthesizing, uh, transporting nutrients and our um, products out of it very completely. And it'll just make it um, much more suitable for the end of fermentation than it would if you didn't add any nitrogen. So some yeast do just fine, but this is kind of a safety protocol. And also if you have a yeast that you really like, that's just having a difficult time, you probably should add that or start measuring it in some way or form. Okay, oxygen. So typically when we, like I said, typically when we talk about exposing wine to oxygens to be avoided because you don't want to lose all those beautiful flavors and aromas. You don't want to start browning your wine. But during fermentation, this oxygen is extremely important, especially um, in the beginning stages, to create, again, healthy, strong cell walls that will last through the whole fermentation. So oxygen is involved with synthesizing sterols and fatty acids that create cell walls, and it also helps in population growth as well. It also helps, too, if your wine is having a stressed fermentation. Sometimes the yeast isn't getting enough oxygen. If your wine is starting to smell like uh, stinky eggs or um, eggy farts, I know, it's kind of gross, um, give it some more oxygen. Do an extended pump over, and eventually that smell will blow off, and your yeast will probably be a lot happier at that point. Also, look at your nutrients as well. Okay, so this has a big star on it, so you probably should know how to draw this for an exam. Hint, hint. This is the yeast cell growth phase curve. Okay, so this is basically what happens every time you have a fermentation in wine. Um, it's a, applied to a lot of other things too, but for specifically we're going to talk about it for wine in this case. So here on the x-axis we always have time. time. So this is, you know, at the beginning of your fermentation, this is the end of your fermentation. And then on the y-axis here we have the basically, don't worry about this, is basically the um, cell count. So how many cells you have in your fermentation because as we talked about earlier how they split through um excuse me they split through binary fission and budding so you put in a certain amount of population expecting it to you know multiply and multiply in an exponential kind of way to help you get through your fermentation so here we have what's called the lag phase. This is when you'd first bring in your grapes and you add the yeast to it. So you add your yeast, you know, you add your nutrients, you pour it into the must. It doesn't really do much for the first day, typically. First day, it's kind of waking up, it's activating, it's a, you know, acclimating to the temperature of the tank that you put it in. There's not much going on. After that, there's what's called the acceleration phase when it really starts to take off. So all of the yeast is finally awake it's active, it's in this beautiful environment with tons of sugar and tons of nitrogen, and it just freaks out. Well, in a good way. <laughs> it starts consuming sugar, you know, it's, it's multiplying, it's multiplying. So again, this is the cell count that we have here. And so they're multiplying, multiplying, reproducing, reproducing. This is the acceleration phase. And as it kind of keeps a constant acceleration, it's called the growth phase. Then we get to a certain amount of time where you know, over time we're increasing in alcohol, we start to have the decline phase. So there's less and less sugar because everyone's eating it all and the cell count is starting to go down. They're, you know, reproducing less and less. And then we kind of hit this plateau called the stationary phase and then eventually the death phase. And that's when um, you'll actually get a negative amount of cell count in the tank because the yeast are starting to lice. They're starting to break open and die. And then that's when that happens getting less and less um, active live yeast. Cool. So yeah, remember this. Okay, temperature. If the temperature is not hot enough, the yeast will not activate. If the temperature is too hot, 
then the yeast will be overstressed and start to die. This is why the temperature is um, regulated during fermentation with cooling jackets on the tank. So if you ever get to go into a winery and you see these lovely dimples on these tanks, they're not just for smiling, they're also to increase the surface area of, of the cooling capabilities of the glycol that's in circulating around those tanks. And these tanks typically have a cooling function and a heating function. So if you need to heat up your wine or cool it down, you have, um, have that avail available to you. Okay, so typical red fermentation runs pretty hot. You know, I touched on this earlier. Typically 75 to 89 degrees. I've seen it hotter than that, um, but this is typically where yeast are most happy. It's what's on the bag. This is typically what they advise for you. Uh, typical white wines or rosés are a lot cooler, a lot slower fermentations. It's typically around 45 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, cool. Alcohol inhibition. Hey, this is, the, this is the curve we just saw a couple slides ago. So um, increasing amounts of alcohol in must as it turns to wine will lice yeast cells. So this is why you determine potential alcohol. And we talked about this a couple slides ago, just reinforcing um, levels that are too high can put you at major risk for stuck fermentation. Saccharomyces species are not fit for fermenting past 15% alcohol. There's no guarantee it's going to make it past 15. If you can push them that hard, good for you. Uh, but as far as what the manufacturers recommend, anything past 15 is going to be rough. So here again, we have the same growth phase curve for cells of the yeast cells. And we have time, the cell count, our lag phase, acceleration phase, but as you can see, I kind of added a, um, a line here. So over time, the sugar is being converted to alcohol, of course. So, I mean, you could replace time with alcohol content, right? So this could be zero alcohol, 1%, 2%, 3%, all the way up to 15% over time, okay? So around 15% is when you see this death phase, 100%. Yeah, 15% alcohol, you see death among the cells because they just can't, uh, hold up in that environment. It's not healthy for their cell walls. It becomes very toxic for them. Okay, so in order to avoid that from happening, that's when we see um, people add water to prevent a stuck fermentation. Um, I'd put a big star on this slide too because you can bet this calculation will be on an assignment or, and on the exam coming up. Uh, it's a very simple uh, calculation. It's uh, C1, B1 equals C2, V2. And this is just a concentration times volume, concentration times volume, the ones being the initial, so initial bricks, initial volume, and then your desired bricks and your end volume, okay? So an example for this is you have a must at 29 bricks, you'd like, to, like it to be near 24. You currently have 50 gallons of must. How much water should you add to your must, okay? So you have 29 bricks, times 50 gallons, so it's our initial sugar, our initial volume, right? I want it to go down to 24 bricks, so this is the desired sugar content times desired volume. Okay, and the units cancel, so this is all this is all good in uh, stoichiometry terms. So, but here, this is extremely important, I want you guys to notice that it's X gallons plus 50 gallons. So you have to account for the dilution that you're making, okay? You don't know what your final volume is because you're trying to figure that out. You're trying to figure out what I'm adding to those 50 gallons to get it down to 24, okay? So then it's very simple. 29 times 50 equals 1450, 1450 right here. And then we would distribute this 24 over, okay? Simple distribution here. So 24 times X and also 24 times 50. You distribute it into the parentheses, taking it back to high school algebra here. So 1450 equals 24x plus 1200, okay? Then we just need to isolate and solve for x. So we would subtract 1200 from both sides. 1450 minus 1200 equals 250. Then 250 equals 24x. Divide by 24 on both sides, you get 10.42 gallons of water equals x. So that's how much water you need to add to drop the bricks, that amount. Okay, so this is just a very simplified version of a calculation. I mean, if you have must, obviously you're going to have some skins left in there. So you have to account for that. 
there's, uh, there's an equation for that. There's also wine business calculator if you'd like to know. For the, ver for the purpose of this class, I'm going to keep it to the basics. Um, this equation would be perfectly fine for a white wine. If you wanted to um, approximate the volume for a must, I would say do two-thirds, uh, maybe three-quarters. Eh. Yeah, anywhere between two-thirds to three-quarters of your volume. I'd say if your must is most likely liquid, the rest is most likely the pumice that will be left over. So use that value for your gallons and go from there and kind of adjust as you need to. Cool. Okay. On to more of the yeast topic. What is yeast flora? So yeast are unicellular organisms like we covered. They pretty much exist on every surface. So anywhere there is an animal or a plant, um, yeast is going to exist on that surface and it can be transported, you know, through the wind, um, through the butt of a honeybee, through, you know, um, a person walking by and their, the pant leg, you know, brushing the side of a plant. So this is, this is the, um, world that we live in. There's microbes all over the place. Um, they get spread. They all have their own characteristics. They'll have their own purpose. So these are called native or wild yeasts. And uh, they're in vineyards and cellars. Um, but these are not the same yeast that we typically add to our must. So I know we touched on this a little bit early, earlier. A lot of um, wineries will use native yeast to ferment. Um, it can give a lot more complexity. Unfortunately, they're not bred to withstand. <coughs> excuse me, not bred to withstand the high alcohol concentrations that Saccharomyces are. Um, but it is possible to work out. It's kind of a risk. I'd recommend running a test first instead of just jumping straight into it. It's a lot of money um, that you could put down the drain potentially. And you just don't really know what flavors and aromas they're gonna uh, that they're gonna create. So it's it is a risk, like I said. But oftentimes it can create really beautiful, complex wines as long as the hygiene of your winery or wherever you're creating your this beverage. Um, is is positive so it's good to know good to know okay cool so this is kind of just reinforcing again the importance of temperature and fermentation so for white wines you want a cooler and slower fermentation because this preserves delicate aromas so the faster the fermentation goes the more carbon dioxide you're producing the faster that's producing it's kind of just blowing out all of those beautiful flavors and aromas of your wine if you can smell it you are losing it basically so you don't want to you know want to go too fast you want to go slower for red wines you have typically warmer fermentations this because you want this especially for reds because this will extract color phenolics and tannins from the skins so when you think of a red wine fermentation think of brewing tea you want hot water so you can extract that color those flavors aromas and mouthfeel from the tea so you can have it as an enjoyable beverage so same concept okay now we're going to move into um, different types of fermentation tanks or vessels uh, this is a really fun uh, topic to go into especially if you go get to tour at wineries you can see if they have these are not, and also you see the purpose of them as well. They all provide slightly different outcome, but um, similar purpose is just to be a vessel to hold the fermenting um, must. So we have our typical stainless steel tank fermentation. There's also concrete tanks. There's egg-shaped tanks. There's a wooden tanks, which are called a foodra or a fooder, I believe. And then there's also barrels. You can ferment in barrels as well. So that's just kind of the, the top five that I picked uh, for this class. If you get to travel and you get the chance to see more interesting things, there's definitely uh, more bizarre things out there, but um, that's just kind of what we're going to talk about today. So on to stainless steel tanks. Typically, 99.9% .9 of the time, um, they have a double jacket cooling system that circulates ethylene glycol. Other possibilities that could be circulating in there are um, uh, water, which is not extremely energy efficient, and then ammonia, but ammonia is very toxic. So typically ethylene glycol is the middle of the road there. Um, this is the most, these are the most effective at temperature control, and it's also the most cleanable option because stainless steel doesn't have any pores like wood or even um, any type of microsurfaces like concrete. 
So you know that when you clean that and you sanitize that, that it's 100% clean. You don't have to worry about any type of spoilage in that tank at all. So that's that's the that's the pro of using stainless steel tanks. That's why we see so much of them in the industry. Okay, concrete tanks. Um, they're they were actually uh, used to be a California standard for wine tanks before prohibition began, which is pretty interesting. I don't know if it's because they were less expensive. Um, that'd be my best guess. Um, but they are fascinating. They do offer micro oxygenation of fermentation to develop flavors. Uh, I'm not exactly sure about the chemistry behind that, but I have read that from several different sources. They also, a lot of people say they add mineral minerality to the wine because of all of the minerals that are in concrete. It naturally gets seeped into the wine. Uh, mostly a neutral contributions from the tank besides that though. So it's, it doesn't have any wood. It's not contributing any more flavor. Um, one thing I have seen is that the wine acids can start to degrade cement. So um, probably over time, these tanks have to be kind of patched up in a certain way or resurfaced, I think would be a better word for that. Um, some of these do offer a cooling jacket system. Some of the more modern tanks, um, some of them do not. So um, so yeah, they're kind of cool. With these two, especially, um, you know, they're very beautiful Oftentimes you'll see uh, kind of like a wooden board laid out across the tops of these or people can walk across and do punch downs or they can do pump overs as well to help mix the tanks during fermentation. Um, so yeah, if you ever get to go to a facility and see these, it's it's pretty cool, I'm not gonna lie. Also these, these egg-shaped tanks. So the reason that these are shaped like an egg is not just to be uh, pro-Easter, but it's also um, done so so that way during the fermentation, the CO2 that's coming off, it goes into sort of an ellipsy uh, shape here and it creates a convection inside the tank. So it actually stirs the tank on by itself, just by its shape. And this is wonderful um, because you get more um, uniform fermentations like we have over here. Um, you also, if you, the wine remains inside of there for aging, the current continues, uh, making a continuous batonnage, which is more lees contact, resulting in better uh, texture or mouthfeel in the wine. So if you're interested in reading about those, go ahead and click on the link. I got lots of information on that. And we're going to talk about batonnage in the next slide. So hold tight. Okay. Batonnage. It's, it's a French term, which might be why I'm totally butchering it. But um, this is something that's done typically to extract um, more flavor, aroma, and texture, texture specifically from the lees. So it, just a little review, lees is the sediment that falls to the bottom. It's typically the dead yeast cells um, in any type of like grape pulp or skin that's left after the fermentation. It's all of that sediment. So um, basically you would stir this to to get all of those components from the cell walls, all of all of those fatty acids and the sterols, you'd want to extract that and hope hope that that stays behind in the wine to help the mouthfeel, basically. But you have to be really careful. Um, you don't want the lees to stay in there for too long. And if it's the lees is smelling stinky, you have to remove it right away. Um, this, the lees can become reductive. That's the term for that. And um, also, this is typically seen um, barrel fermented Chardonnay is the most common um, time you'll see this. You can also see it in Viognier, other white wines. Typically, a white wine um, characteristics, you can do it with reds as well. It's just a lot of work because you have to stir them uh, multiple times and for a, a per extended period of time as well. So the amount that you would do that would be up to the, the winemaker for the amount of extraction that they're looking for. Okay, a, a foudre or foudre. So these are like the ancient containers, okay? So this is for um, aging and holding wine. These are extremely large, um, definitely larger than traditional barrels. So a large wooden vat um, holds more than 100,000 liters and that's more than 26,000 gallons of wine. So that's amazing. Um, these have fallen out of favor because of the high cost, um, high cost to have them and high maintenance. 
So um, any type of beetles would start eating into the wood. You could have leaks in the wine. Um, you know, any type of spoilage that gets into the pores of the wood is extremely difficult to get rid of. So um, these are amazing vessels, and any place that has these has some serious money, and you should definitely enjoy them because they're beauties. I mean, just, you know, just for comparison, like, this does not look very large in the picture. If you were to stand next to it, your head might be right here at the bottom, you know, or, or just barely above this. You know, this is just a gigantic, gigantic tank. Very cool, for sure. Okay, barrels. Uh, oak is the most popular but they can be made from cherry, walnut, and chestnut. Uh, oak typically gives more tannin, vanilla, tea, and tobacco-like characteristics. Um, and then there's two different species of oak we have here. We have uh, Quercus rober or Quercus sessiflora. That's the species, genus and species for French oak. For uh, American oak, it's typically Quercus alba. So um, they'll give different flavors and aromas because they're um, different types of oak. But um, we'll go over that in the next slide. But I would like to see help you guys see the anatomy of a barrel. So this is the head of the barrel. It's on the top and the bottom. They're both heads. And then we have these hoops, the metal hoops. Then we have the staves. Staves are the these long pieces that go from front to back. Uh, different joints going on, rivets to keep the hoops together. And then we have the bunghole and the bung, that's the actual literal term for it. Bunghole is the hole that we you know, pour the wine or take it out of the barrel, and then the bung goes in the bunghole and keeps wine from spilling out and keeps uh, other things from getting inside of it. So, yes. Uh-huh, okay. So, for each type of oak, there's different types of toasts as well. So there's a light toast. So this is um, oak that was charred for a shorter amount of time. The medium toast, it was charred for a little bit longer, and then a heavy toast is obviously um, charred for, I guess, um, the longest out of all of them. Typically, uh, barrels are made at a cooperage, and someone who works at a cooperage is called a cooper. They um, have a really intense job. You actually have to build a fire within the barrel to get the oak to bend, and then uh, you have to basically bend it together that way and then put on the hoops to get it to be stable. It's pretty amazing. I would definitely Google it. It's pretty crazy what these people do working under the fire all day um and it's a very ancient and traditional um job too and a lot of people you know this, think about it, this is just a job that's been handed down for centuries and we're still doing it today it's and the science hasn't changed too much either so it's pretty amazing to think that you know people still do that <laughs> in this day and age you know it's not all completely uh, mechanized you know machines aren't building these barrels yet so, um, we'll have to enjoy that while it lasts. So, for American oak, we'll start with that. For a light toast, you get, you know, vanilla, dill, coconut, right? Okay, medium toast, you get a little bit, um, you know, more medium flavors. So, vanilla, honey, caramel toast, roasted nuts, strong coconut, roast coffee, and cocoa. Okay, so, the, all of... And then, so what American oak has in common, no matter what the toast, is vanilla. So whenever you think of American oak, think vanilla. I like to think of Coca-Cola with American oak because it kind of, to me, has like a, you know, I think of vanilla, Coca-Cola, and I think America. You know, like what's more American than Coca-Cola? I don't know. Probably a lot of other things too. But that helps me remember American oak. Okay. Uh, next we have um, the heavy toast, which is the strong roast coffee, espresso, caramelized sugar, tiramisu, wood smoke, and vanilla. And this is wonderful because um, it really, you can see the progression of flavors. So you can see how you'd want, you might want to use some of this in different wines. You know, for a lighter bodied wine, typically lighter toast or even white wines. Um, for a much heavier, darker wine like a Cabernet Franc. Um, go for the heavier toast, then mediums. You know, it's really up to the winemaker in their preference. They get to choose these things. Similar but different, we have French oak and Hungarian oak. And we do have some vanilla in these guys in the lighter toasts. But, um, you know, typically we get baking spices, chocolate, cigar box, cedar. So we get that oaky, um, chocolatey, and spiciness from French oak. And then uh, creme brulee, fantastic. Um, cedar, Asian spices, 
and then Hungarian oak. We have butterscotch, banana, very different, sarsaparilla, sweet spice, and then finally butterscotch, toffee, and molasses. So definitely some similarities, but um, there is some nuances between the oaks, and um, definitely want to be uh, careful when you choose those about what you're working with. Cool. In addition, um, this is just one different barrel program. Um, so not everyone can afford to buy new barrels. Uh, so alternatively, people can use oak chips or they can um, get what's called inner staves or any type of other alternative stave to place inside of barrels that might have gone neutral. Typically, barrels will go neutral after um, three vintages of use. They'll start to lose the amount of flavor that they can extract into wine. So inner stave is just an example of one of those numerous programs. Um, so this is a program where they would actually take off the head of the barrel. As you can see here, is this guy working with his giant hat. So he's taken off the head of the barrel and then they insert what's almost like a new set of ribs inside. So this is brand new French oak, French plus. And then they um, drill it in to the barrel and then they leave it clear of the bunghole that's right here. And then they put the head back on and then they'll brand the top so that, you, that way you know exactly what oak is inside. So this is an inner stave, it has the date that it was put in, and then you'd know this is French plus, FR plus, French plus. So one of the amazing things that we have with our industry, uh, it's you know, very cool to see how people can save costs and also still create high quality wines. But um, yeah, hopefully that interests you. And now you can say that you've finally seen what the inside of a wine barrel looks like. It's very beautiful, by the way. Um, and yeah, wonderful. So here are your guys' review questions. Um, these will be on the exam in the exact same form. I definitely would recommend doing that. Recommend going over the slides that have stars on them, creating flashcards, making sure you know how to draw things, and making sure you guys know how to do your calculations. Also, let's see the C1B1, where'd that go? Aha, here we go. Know this slide, very important, okay? Work on that calculation. If you are having a difficult time, feel free to reach out to me, okay? It's very important. All right, sweet. Well, without further ado, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.